be killing so many people. Tell me what words you associate with oxycodone. Hello everyone, welcome back this week. Now, if you are new here, I'm Dr. Han, and this week we are having something different and exciting to discuss. Now, in this video, I'm going to dive into a new Netflix series that has been creating quite a buzz. But what makes it even more interesting is that I'm going to put on my professor hat and analyze it from a pharmaceutical and medical perspective. Silence. The Netflix series that we are going to explore today is called Painkiller. Now it has been generating a lot of attention for its unique angles uh, to look at the opioid epidemic or opioid crisis. Most importantly, I want to explain what is the fact versus what is fiction in the show and share my personal opinion on who was the real main criminal that has caused tens of thousands of lives in the U.S. Now, now what caught my attention uh, as a pharmacology professor and a pharmacist is that the pain medicine OxyContin featured in the series. Uh, from what I've seen, they've done a great job in portraying all the suffering patients went through with OxyContin within the six episodes. Now here, I'm not going to dissect each episode, but I'm going to look at it in a global scale. So let's first get the boring stuff out of the way. Now, yes, OxyContin is chemically related to heroin. Heroin, morphine, and oxycodone, which is the chemical name for OxyContin, are all opioids, meaning they are derived from the opium poppy plant, and interact with the body's opioid receptors to provide pain relief and potentially induce euphoria, meaning feeling of happiness. Opium derived from the poppy plant has been used for its medicinal properties for thousands of years. Ancient civilizations in Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Greece were familiar with the pain relief properties of opium poppies. The Sumerians mentioned the use of the joy plant, opium, in their writings as early as 4000 BC. Morphine is one of the most well-known and oldest natural opioids. It is derived directly from the opium poppy plant, or more precisely, the sap of the seed capsule. The morphine is often used for severe pain relief. And heroin is a semi-synthetic opioid that is derived from morphine. It is created by modifying morphine through chemical processes. And heroin is more lipophilic, meaning fat-soluble, than morphine, which allows it to cross the blood-brain barrier more rapidly, leading to a quicker onset of effects, including a powerful euphoria. Now, however, this also makes it more addictive and increases its potential for abuse. Heroin is not used for medical purposes in most countries due to its highly addictive nature and strong potential for harm. Now, oxycodone is a synthetic opioid that is designed to be active when it's taken by mouth and have pain relief properties similar to morphine. It is often used for moderate to severe pain management, such as after surgery or in cases of chronic pain. Oxycodone binds to the same opioid receptors in the brain and the spinal cord as morphine and heroin, producing analgesic or pain relief effects. Oxycontin is the branding product for oxycodone in extended release form. Although Purdue Pharma marketed oxycontin as a low-risk addiction opioid drug during the early years, it was far from the truth. Individuals misuse oxycontin by crushing, snorting, or injecting it to bypass the time release mechanism and experience a rapid and intense opioid effect. Now, this misuse can lead to a more intense euphoria, increasing the potential for abuse and addiction. Now, we now know oxycontin is an effective but dangerous painkiller. Um, but how it became the origin of the American opioid crisis. Now, 
Purdue Pharma marketed OxyContin as a breakthrough in pain management, emphasizing its long-lasting effect. The company claimed that the extended release formulation made the drug less likely to be abused, but there was no evidence supporting that specific claim. They also adopted aggressive marketing strategies to promote OxyContin. The sales representatives reportedly downplayed the drug's abuse potential and addiction risk during their interactions with healthcare providers. The company's sales representatives were specifically trained to target doctors, including primary care physicians, and encourage them to prescribe OxyContin for a wider range of pain conditions. They even invented the term "pseudo addiction" to describe patients who appeared to be seeking more medication due to undermanaged pain, potentially leading doctors to increase doses and prescribing rates. Now, using、um, pushies like to market a highly addictive drug certainly softens the danger of the drug, and they were quite successful in drafting a seemingly harmless image. Now we all know that was only a part of Purdue Farmers,、um, Purdue Farmers' deceptive marketing. I got my life back. Was the title featured in Purdue's promotional video in the late 1990s? Was it true or not? Now in the promotional video, they featured a chart that showed oxycontin appearing to stay at steady levels in the blood for 12 hours. But that was just another perfect example of deceptive marketing, only at a much higher level. The chart used in the video was a logarithmic scale, not a linear scale that is routinely used to present this kind of data. Regular consumers certainly would not spot the differences. It wasn't even easy for medical doctors and other non-pharmaceutical scientists to spot that differences. Simply put. If that graph were to be plotted on a linear scale, the oxycontin level in the blood would drop much faster before the twelve-hour period ended. Yes,、um, Curtis Wright was a real person. Now, is he good or not? I'll let you to judge. Curtis Wright, who holds the title of M.D. and Ph.D. Served as the sole FDA examiner during the review of OxyContin's new drug application, or NDA, in the mid 1990s. As a medical officer, he was responsible for evaluating the safety and efficacy data of the drug to determine whether it should be approved for marketing. Purdue presented OxyContin's delayed absorption and claimed it was able to reduce abuse liability. But they presented no scientific data to back that up. Simply put, delayed absorption does not equal to reduce abuse liability. Dr. Wright apparently did not question that claim enough and put the stamp of oxycontin's approval. Now, if the story had ended there, we could say Dr. Wright was a lousy medical officer. But Dr. Wright left the FDA a year after OxyContin's approval, and went to work for a pharmaceutical company called Eldolor. Two years later, in 1998, he joined Purdue Pharma as the executive director of medical research for the company. According to the book *Empire of Pain* by Patrick Redden Keefe, claimed that. Dr. Wright received a first-year salary package of four hundred thousand at Purdue Pharma. Now, that was a perfect example of the long history of the FDA's revolving door in the pharmaceutical industry that I previously talked about. Now, despite Dr. Wright denied having any conversation about joining Purdue during the OxyContin review process, only he and the company. Know what truly happened behind the door, but sadly, the revolving door was not the only part. Under current FDA law, 
drug makers can promote only a product that has been proven safe and effective, and the product's benefits must also outweigh the risk. Now, but there have been no long-term studies to show opioids are safe and effective for what Purdue was marketing. And if FDA had done its job properly, it would have told Purdue that they should only promote opioids for palliative care, meaning serious illnesses such as cancer pain, and should not allow sales reps to promote OxyContin to primary care providers and doctors who are not specialized in palliative care. Yes, no one from Purdue Pharma has gone to jail, at least not yet, as of today. Purdue faced legal action from private parties and state attorneys general, and responded by settling and declaring bankruptcy. However, in the original bankruptcy proposal, the Sackler family, who privately owned Purdue, would have been allowed to keep billions of dollars they had withdrawn from the company. A different judge later in 2021 ruled that the previous settlement should not proceed because it released the Sackler family from liability, and the family had withdrawn over ten billion dollars from Purdue as the opioid epidemic was worsening, and deposited in offshore accounts and trusts. And the litigation is ongoing. Most recently. President Joe Biden's administration challenged a Purdue Farmers' six billion bankruptcy settlement, and the U.S. Supreme Court agreed to hear that case. Now, so far, we've looked at the scientific aspect of OxyContin's danger and the failure of the drug regulatory process. However, the legal system was also severely abused by the rich owners and stakeholders of Purdue Pharma. Now, okay, I know someone could argue that the pause. Uh, could delay the settlement and the compensation to the victims' families, but just to be clear, the settlement would also set the Sackler family free forever, and will face no further legal consequences. Now, even with the six billion settlement, the family would still have about that much money left to spend. Can we even use money to measure the tens of thousands of people who lost their lives due to produce deceptive marketing and regulatory failure? Now, some last thought here is that clearly a lot of people died and families suffered from、uh, the misuse of oxycontin, and Purdue cannot escape their criminal responsibilities in this opioid crisis. But when we think deeper, it is not so surprising to see criminal activities from pharmaceutical companies. It happened a lot of the time, and at the end of the day, profit is their number one goal. What was the most disappointing was the revolving door. The FDA is supposed to be our gatekeeper, yet we have FDA officials like Dr. Curtis Wright that failed to recognize and act appropriately when OxyContin was presented to them. And during the review, there was no evidence to show OxyContin is anywhere less addictive. However, the FDA bought the idea at the time, and that is a clear example of how the gatekeeper failed to work. Now, someone could argue again that they didn't know what they didn't know at the time because the drug formulation was new to the market, and it so it got slipped through the FDA's hawk eye.、Um, but think about these days. What happened these days? Now we have drugs that may not be as effective as they claimed in certain populations because there were no clinical trials in particular populations. But we have the highest ranking. FDA officers promoting the drug on social media. Now, tell me how history always repeat itself. So, in my opinion, who was the real main responsible for all the lost lives and who paved the road to the opioid crisis? If you're still watching at this point, you would have the answer. I don't have to give it to you clearly, right? Now, lastly, I want to emphasize that I'm not promoting for Netflix. Check it out if you are interested in in the show. Now, although Painkiller, the show is fiction, there are plenty of facts based on the real world. Now, it serves as a good reminder of the deceptive marketing strategy of the pharmaceutical industry and the regulatory failure we are facing in today's world. 
Now, if you want to learn more about how drug advertising could harm patients, uh, uh, check out this video. And if you enjoyed uh, this video and find it informative, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more content. If you have already watched Painkiller or are watching it, I'd like to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Until next time, please eat healthily and stay healthy and take good care of yourself and your family. Bye.